Ladies and gentlemen, there are some ladies here, aren't there? Yeah. There's three of you, or four. Yeah, well, there's more. And I hope there are some gentlemen here as well. <clears throat> I'm CCP Blofeld, and I've been with CCP for a year and a half now. And as director of IT, one of my overall responsibilities is information security. And in that area, we've had quite some turbulence and some big changes in the recent year. And uh, just a couple of months after I joined, uh, our information security director at the time decided to leave us. I guess he didn't like me that much. Uh, so, what f <laughs> <laughs> so what followed uh, was a few months period where we were not up to full capacity, I think it's fair to say. And uh, after a long and careful recruitment process, uh, we managed to find a, a great candidate for this job man with really strong technical background and real passion for information security. And I'm confident that he's taken us onto the right path for security, both for CCP and the EVE universe. I'll allow him to introduce the rest of the team, but without further ado, allow me to introduce our new Director of Information Security, CCP Bug Artist. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Mr. Blofeld. Um, yeah, without any further delay, we want to start into the presentation. We are going to talk about security at CCP, and uh, this, is, this will be the first time that we actually also present information regarding information security at CCP globally. So how it looks like, what are some of our hot topics. And um, we also, of course, going to start with why the hell we are actually here. Mr. Blofeld already gave an introduction on why I'm here, and uh, you might have spotted also other new faces in, in the lineup on, the, on today's stage, and uh, that's what we're going to start with. And then I will give a little bit more of an introduction into the today's agenda and um, what highlights we're going to present. Yeah, first off, um, as already noticed, I'm CCP Bug Artist. I'm the new director of information security, started end of last year. Uh, took over responsibility of team security as well, so not only of information security at CCP, but also of in-game security aspects. And um, I started with IT when I was seven, got my first computer. Uh, started hacking computer games when I was 11, and uh, ended up as a security professional, security consultant, 2003 and did security consultancy for the last 11 years before I joined CCP, leading some security teams, consultancy teams in the last few years, and doing information security consultancy, penetration testing, and all these kind of things for quite a few years before I ended up on this wonderful island in Iceland. Yeah, over to the other member of the InfoSec part of the team, uh, which is CCP Random, maybe a few words by yourself. Yeah, I'm CCP Random. I'm at CCP for uh, three months. So three months CCP already on stage. Let's see how this works out. <laughs> well, kidding. I'm uh, doing information security since late 2008. And I've been doing it for companies in Germany, mostly where I'm from. So I'm also new to Iceland and enjoying the original Icelandic experience. Then, oh, <laughs> over to uh, our dear colleague, CCP Krimi. Yeah. I'm, I'm Krimi. I started working for CCP in 2003 in customer support. Did that for uh, many years. I never had a computer because they weren't there when I was a kid in the 70s, or not that common at least. So um, I joined uh, Team Security, uh, the current form of it, uh, this uh, March, I believe, I think it was. So two months. Uh, and uh, not a whole lot more to say for now. Um, and you might have seen me, especially if you're a, a botter, I'm CCP Peligro. I've been in, uh, at CCP since 2006. I started as a GM uh, in uh, 2006 uh, until 2007. And then I moved into the Internal Affairs Department, and I've been there until 2012 when I joined Team Security. Uh, there's a lot of overlap with those skill sets, so uh, I still do some of, some of both. Uh, but if you're a bad guy, you might have seen me before. We only have good guys in this room. Absolutely. 
Uh, maybe one, one additional word to the overall structure and how security is structured at CCP at the moment. Um, as you can see, and I tried to highlight that with some wonderful graphics, um, CCP security overall, of course, includes uh, the information security aspects as well as the uh, in-game security aspects. Uh, the information security aspects are covered by the InfoSec team. If you have read our dev blog that we released like three weeks ago, when I'm right, um, then you have seen some of our, or how the new structure looks like already. Team security um, also includes uh, the other members of information security because we are working heavily together and um, we are working on the tool sets, on data analytics, automation of the processes, some of the scripting, and we just like work as a extended arm or the the manual tool set for team security in that case as well, just to make sure that we are able to automate and uh, enhance our capabilities in the in-game security field. Yeah, as noticed, this is the agenda, what we're going to talk about today. Uh, we already did the introduction. We're going to present some updates for information security, I guess it will be more or less the first introduction of what we actually do instead of an update, but especially for team security, this is what you see on a yearly basis. We're going to present you with some updated numbers, but also with some really new numbers, um, information we have never shown before, because also because of um, some, let's say, reservations if this kind of information should be presented or not, uh, but we decided to just go ahead and show you some more details than in all the last years before. And um, we're going to present some security tips and tricks because that's what you're going to see and that's what you're going to get as a message from our presentation, especially from the team security part, that it is very, very important that we um, improve the awareness for all the rules, the policies we have, and how you can actually or should actually use the EVE universe and how you should live in the universe and especially behave. And then we will give you um, an excerpt of our roadmap, the roadmap for information security as well as for team security, uh, what we are doing at the moment and what we're going to do in the next few months and maybe years. Just the last hint, um, we try to finish a few minutes before time in order to allow questions in this room already, in the talk already, but um, we will have our round table as well directly afterwards in Dodixi. The room is Dodixi, it's just around the corner over here. And um, we, of course, invite all of you, or at least as many as will fit into the room, uh, to our round table afterwards. Yeah. As I said, it's a round table, but we cannot guarantee that the table will be round as I have not been in the room yet. OK, information security. Our goal is to improve the overall security with CCP globally. Um, what we do in order to do that is, of course, uh, a lot of technology involvement. That means we need to um, enhance our technology, uh, technolo te technical capabilities, but also we need to improve um, all of our management capabilities in regards to security, and we are heavily working on that. We are sharpening the processes. Um, we are tailoring down and aligning the processes globally. That means, as you, all of you know, I guess, we have multiple locations. We have different games being developed at different locations. Uh, we are spread all over the globe with our employers and our staff members, with external volunteers and with external consultants and partners working together. And it's, of course, a challenge to get all of that um, based and aligned to the same rules and the same policies, like with the in-game rules and policies. And also, not only to make people aware of it and make them understand why it's very important, but also to support them in implementing security in their daily work. Um, up-to-date or actual topics, uh, that's what we're going to see on the next slides as well, and more in detail, like um, fighting threats or handling incidents like denial of service attacks. Most of you, if you play EVE, and I guess you do, otherwise you would not be here, um, have noticed that over the last few months we have been a very hot target for denial of service attacks. Um, CCP Random is going to give you some more insight on that, some numbers, how often ha we have been attacked, how the attacks look like, and what we can actually do in order to detect and mitigate them before you guys detect them by getting disconnected. The way on how we do all of that at CCP at the moment is that, um, as I said, it's not only important to have technology in place, 
but it's major important to train people, to train our developers, to train all of our staff, our IT members, um, and to align everybody to work together um, in the same direction when it comes to security as well. So of course it's very important that we keep productive and that we that we always aim to, to keep our release dates, but it's also very important that we do not forget that it's, that it's major critical to protect all of your data and also your virtual assets as well as your identity when it comes to the account management to secure if online.com, for example. Some of you mentioned um, every time you see something and that's very, very appreciated. You mentioned in the forums or via bug report, hey guys, please fix that SSL problem on, on your servers or please update your certificate. That's perfect and we would love to see that in the future as well. Maybe a little bit more channeled and uh, addressed to the, right, uh, to the right addresses and to the right contacts. But that's what we're going to work on together with you as well, because you are one of the uh, most important assets we have, actually the most important asset, our, our customers and our players, and we want to involve you in the whole process as well. Um, also, what we're working on at the moment is to get a better structure for information security in all of CCP based on how we offer security services to all the different departments. Um, maybe just a few examples. Um, if you are, for example, a developer in CCP, you write a new piece of code and you want to get some advice on um, is that how we should do it in regards to security or are there any risks involved with this crypto library or, and things like that, then uh, the developers can come to us, uh, can ask for advice or if we have ever seen something similar or how we would recommend to do it and then we're going to work on the project together, we provide them with advice or maybe some hints in which direction to go. We also, of course, provide internal um, like security assessments and penetration tests for, for specific applications, pieces of code and stuff like that. I already said this is a very new setup of the team, um, especially the two of us, um, CCP Random and I, we just recently joined. That's why uh, most of these things are still being implemented in our um, overall security strategy. I already mentioned that aligning all the processes and metrics is, uh, are very important as well, but uh, I guess you get the point already. Yeah, with that, I want to hand over to CCP Random in order to give you all an insight on how the denial of service attacks we faced worked and Thank you. what is behind all that. So, who of you took part in the Burn Jita event recently? I guess a couple of people. So, for this virtual event that we saw, there is an uh, equivalent. So, you guys are trying to get into Jita, and you might see that the gate is closed because it only hosts 2,000 people at once. For a DDoS situation, the situation is quite similar. You have many people who are in one hub, or they're trying to get to one place, and then the target appears to be closed. I guess I have to get the remote somewhere. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, okay. Sorry. So, what you see is you have an increase of traffic that is directed to one hub. If that hub is a router, or if it's a gate, or if it's a star system, doesn't really matter, it gets overloaded. So what you have is, you have many routes directed to us. You see an increase. What I'm showing here is you have a 5%, and then you have 100%. You see 25 times the traffic at one hop. And that hop is not designed to have that much traffic. So what we currently see is we see people who redirect. We see people who are trying to change the frequency or the, the hits that go to one gate. The point is that these traffic anomalies can be early detected, so we see if there's a sudden increase of people heading to Jita, or if there's a sudden increase of network packages that are directed to our borders. The key element to reacting is that you detect these compositional changes early, and that you're able to detect that there are, for example, IPs taking part in the communication that is headed to us, which are part of botnets, or which are you know, already reported. So if that frequency goes up of reported IPs or of traffic, we don't necessarily consider game traffic, we can react relatively early. We had situations like that in 2014 so far for over a dozen times. So it's not something that um, is a one-time event a year or twice a year. It happens, and I guess every company in the world who is hosting or which is hosting uh, a larger portion of an internet activity um, is facing DDoS attacks. So how these attacks in general work is like this. You have an initiator, and that's mostly somebody who has got a benefit from this. So for Burn Jita, it's somebody who has got a political benefit or a market benefit or whatever. 
And for a DDoS, it may be a competitor or it may be just people who like to, you know, fuck us up. So what you see is this attack hits our data center and you see that usually the attack is composed out of compromised PCs. And we detect the initial pattern and we prepare the mitigation. So this is how the mitigation looks like. What you see is instead of us receiving the traffic, the traffic is received by a scrubbing center. So the attack traffic gets washed away and the game traffic passes. So this is probably what you expect. You want to continue playing EVE Online. Nevertheless, there is a DDoS attack and we want to remain up and running and we are behind the scrub center. So what you get is instead of connecting directly to us, you connect to a scrub center. What the attacker gets is his traffic gets black holed. In general, how we integrate ourselves into the early detection is like this. We have an IDS, which is you know, a couple of very um, active and um, yeah, sensors who pay attention, which are symbolized by the meerkats here. So they look at security feeds to find out is this IP which is connecting to our data center as part of a botnet or not. And then we have some monitoring, of course, to be able to say, hey, this event is not necessarily related to a DDoS attack. It is related to some router outrage or something else on the network. And then we have a dashboard, which tells us about the traffic anomaly, which is symbolized by the snake here. And we have the IDS alert and correlation. And also we keep track of the attacks, how they happened and what scale they are on. So let me pass over the microphone because now we are going to continue with the team security part. Thank you. So in this uh, section, we'll start uh, talking about some rules and policy updates uh, that we did uh, last year and some uh, new ones that we're going to be doing. Uh, then we'll go into some numbers uh, about the uh, band accounts and stuff like that. And uh, at the end, we'll be reading the EULA from start to finish <laughs> together. <laughs> so uh, last year, we did some changes for uh, botting policy. It used to be three strikes and we changed it to two strikes in order to simplify and also for a better deterrent. And uh, we're uh, pretty happy with the results, if I may say so. Absolutely. Um, here you can see, uh, or let me quickly introduce the ESTF. It's our automated uh, bot detection and banning system. Uh, it's absolutely not the only system we have in place. Uh, it accounts maybe for 10, 20% of all the, the bot bans that we do but it is an important uh, tool for us. Um, and what you can see on this graph is that we have, um, under the old three-strike system, we had uh, repeat offenders, um, you know, second strike, third strike, and uh, it was all too convoluted and uh, time-consuming. And uh, we wanted to simplify that process. And uh, if you can move to the next one, I think you can see some decent results here. Uh, you see we have a lot less repeat offenders. You get one chance and that's it. Um, it's simplified and I think um, the feedback that we got from the players as well was that the three strikes were too lenient and that uh, we want to give you the ability to go legit uh, so you get one chance. But after that, not so much. Uh, yeah, you're gone. Uh, over here we see uh, the types of bots that have been banned in this ESTF bans. Uh, at the beginning in, in April and uh, May, or March, April and May maybe, there's, like, uh, there's a kind of a spike. That was uh, an effort to clean up before we did the policy change. That would, uh, we usually do that when we make a change in policy so that we can measure the impact we have afterwards. Um, we'll come back to that spike a little bit later. Yeah, it's important for a different slide. Uh, so we're going to start uh, adopt a new policy for the ISK buyers. Yeah. So that's um, currently in the, you have four chances, and we are going to three chances. And yeah. the first one will be a seven-day temporary ban and the removal of the ISK. Currently, you just get a warning and we take your ISK. So you know we want a better deterrent for that. As well. Yeah, the, uh, the old four strike policy for ISK buyers uh, even predates Plex, so it's been around forever. Um, and uh, I think it's time to change that. Uh, the first strike warning doesn't really have as much of a sting as we would like it to have, and maybe doesn't um, uh, 
relate the message of how serious RMT actually is, especially uh, to CCP and the issues that it causes us and also you, the players. Um, we'll, we'll come back to that on the subject of account security a little bit later. Um, but I hope you're ready for some graphs because we have some good ones. <laughs> this one here is um, ISK buyers for the period of January 2013 until current date, so about 16 months. Um, we're going to try to apply the same methodology as the ESTF to the ISK buyer process, um, which means that we might move to a two-strike system in the future, but we are trying this three-strike policy first so that we can measure the impact it has. Uh, nobody at CCP is upset about banning bots. Uh, I quite enjoy it. But the ISK buyers, of course, are, um, are our players, and we would uh, prefer not to permanently ban any of you. Uh, this is a, a, quite a shift because uh, people will buy ISK and they'll get four chances and um, it, it hasn't really been producing the results we would like to see. So uh, we're going to try to tighten that up and uh, hopefully reduce the, uh, the amount of repeat offenders there. Is, is this people or accounts? These are accounts. And then uh, the next slide here, you can see a problem that we face uh, with awareness. Uh, more than, yeah, some ridiculous amount of ISK buyers. Most of them are under 100 days old. They're brand new. They want to get into EVE. It's, uh, it's hard, as you all know. And uh, most of people that buy ISK are newer players. Um, so we have to get the message out there uh, in, a, in a better way. Yeah, increasing awareness is a big, big part of our <coughs> plans. Uh, coming to account security, if you remember that spike in April and May for the bot we banned, uh, that shows up immediately in hacked accounts. So that's where the ISK sellers go immediately when we ban their botting accounts. Yeah, so, so we'll, uh, we'll crack down on, on bots and they'll be like, oh, well, we're just going to steal your accounts then. Yeah. Or something else, even worse. So that's where the money comes from when people are buying ISK. The uh, point here is also that they are a business and they're profit driven. So if they can't deliver the ISK that somebody paid for, then they're going to steal it instead. Yeah. Uh, also, if you buy ISK, you are increasing the chances of your account being hacked. So we found that one third of all hacked accounts in the last, uh, since J uh, January 2013, one third of them had been uh, buying ISK previously. Yeah, so you're painting so a gigantic target on your, your yeah. own account. And uh, all the information that you give them will be leveraged against you for... Potentially giving them their you know, your credit card number and stuff like that. So that's not very good. Uh, speaking of credit cards, these are... Uh, the target breach in uh, December, that uh, showed up immediately in our systems as uh, increase in credit card fraud. Yeah, they're uh, opportunists. So 40 million credit cards, yeah, maybe we can make some money on this. Our bots aren't doing so well. Use stolen cards instead. Uh, the dip is, uh, of course, from the uh, banks shutting down the cards and the uh, rate of declines increases. Uh, but you also uh, get a rapid response from us when we see things like this. So when we ban uh, a number of bots, we'll see surges in hacking activity and we'll have to answer that. And we also have to answer to external events such as this one. So we're going through some numbers on banned accounts and stuff like that. Uh, first, we'll uh, just go through a generally you know, what people are banned for. Uh, in the period from 2013 January, we banned 30,000 accounts. Uh, these are permanent and temporary bans. Uh, all of the blue ones and the red ones are, of course, p uh, permanent bans, instant permanent bans, and the macro uses is our policy of two strikes represented. Uh, and then the ISK buyers, the 4%, there are players, and 4% uh, is, is far too many to me. Uh, we, uh, we want to get the message out there, but at the same time, it's not something we're going to put in the tutorial or pester new players with. We want the game experience to be untouched and uh, unsullied by these guys. The ISK spammers that you see in game, the bots that you see in the belts and whatnot. Uh, we definitely don't want that to, to, uh, 
to ruin your immersion in any way. So it's a, it's a tricky um, balance that we have to strike there. Uh, but um, the graph for the ISC buyers showing you that most of them are new. It's something that we could maybe use your help with as well if you're uh, running a corporation or introducing somebody new to the game. It, it would be awesome if you tell them that it's not allowed and that uh, you will get caught and then you'll have your wallet in the red and uh, it's all very unpleasant. Over here we can see uh, the IP that uh, is being used yeah, for this the, is <laughs> for the bank, bank accounts. This is, uh, I have to stress this, really important. This is technical information that people have asked for before, but this is based on the source IP and it doesn't take into account things like proxies or VPNs. So it's not necessarily indicative of where the, uh, the player is from. That's important to note. Uh, it's something that we've been asked for, and it's some information that we have, and it makes for a pretty, pretty graph. So here you go. <laughs> All the nice little flags. That's an interesting question. I know America is our big at market share, so it, it makes sense that they're up there. Um, but um, maybe something for uh, the upcoming dev blog. Yeah, we'll have a dev blog uh, uh, soon after the, after the FanFest, or a in a few weeks, maybe. Uh, so all accounts that we ban have characters on them with skill points. And these are the average skill points on the accounts that have been banned. Uh, if you were here last year, uh, we showed a similar graph, and uh, we showed the skill points trending downwards, which I quite really like. It means that the bots are uh, less efficient, they, uh, they get banned quicker. Um, here we've seen that it's uh, trending slightly upwards again, but that is um, uh, also largely because they've had to resort to buying characters. They can't train uh, a bot up without getting caught because we're staying on top of them. Uh, and so they've, uh, we've increased their cost because they're having to buy characters from legitimate players for, uh, for bot -a disc or RMT disc. Uh, which is why it's not really trending downwards, I think, right now. Um, also, yeah? Um, sometimes we will reverse it. We'll give you your character back and reverse the proceeds. Uh, it yeah, yeah, so yeah. Uh, the question was, uh, if you sell a character to a botter, uh, do we, you know, what happens? To, what happens to you? So, what happens to your risk and stuff like that? Sometimes we reverse it, and sometimes we don't. It just depends on the situation. Yeah. How how quick did we catch it? If yeah. it's two months down the line, the character will probably just be left on that permanently banned account, and uh, the risk has been laundered, so to speak. Uh, yeah, so, I mean, you have no real way of knowing. Yeah, you uh, just who buy the buyer selling is, the and uh, we definitely. Um, want to protect the, the real players, not the bad guys. Yeah. Uh, we have maybe, what, six to, uh, it's like four to eight, on average, the million skill points, but there are some pretty expensive characters in there. So that was the top one, 178 million skill points. There's a lot of these. Uh, yeah, it happens. So that's enormously valuable, clearly. So there's a lot of, a lot of skill points in there. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, we can't do that exactly, you know. Uh, this uh, is the one we had in the blog the other day. We call yeah. it the uh, Swedish motive. Yeah, it's a very nice little Swedish motif. Uh, just over 60,000 counts. Uh, we had some uh, uh, 5,287 ISK buyers, close to 11,000 bots. And the ISK probably is like 750 million on average per account. And this is only the ISK, this is, there's no, va uh, no assets, no shapes or anything. Yeah, uh, so we I've been uh, doing preliminary investigations on the worth of the assets on these accounts, and I can tell you this is a small fraction of, uh, of what is being taken out. Uh, this is raw ISK, and uh, over time we've driven them more towards items because we have uh, great tool sets for uh, reversing ISK transactions and, and similar things, so they've resorted to, uh, you know, items and implants and uh, alternate methods of attempting to launder their, uh, their risk. So we'll I would say this is maybe uh, under 20% of the total worth uh, of the assets and, and stuff on banned accounts. There's some pretty big numbers. Further info on that in the blog.
coming soon. Uh, so we have the characters uh, on the botting accounts. As obviously, you can see. obviously the Caldaria are disproportionately featured here. For some reason, they're probably you know well located or something. I don't know exactly. Industrial so, people. Yes. <laughs> so that's like 62% Caldaria of all the botters, which is interesting. Uh, ships uh, on the band accounts. A lot of them are rookie ships and capsules, which is you know fine if we're catching a lot of rookie ships. It means we're catching them before they're you know too far away, uh, too far along the. You know, catching them pretty early at least. Yeah, uh, these will be guys that start a trial account and are like, oh, I'm going to start to bot, and then two hours later, bam, you're gone. Yeah. Uh, I think our record time for uh, catching an RMT transaction was as it happened live, and then instead of sending a warning, I just went in-game and said, hey, I'm going to take this from you now, you just received it, and... Uh <laughs> so there's plen plen <laughs> plenty of uh, fairly expensive ships. There's carriers in there, 281. Uh, there's... Uh, all kinds of good stuff, and there's six titans <laughs> also. <laughs> so, so we uh, kill titans too. Can't let players have all the fun. Okay. Uh, and this is uh, from last year. So if you were here last year, we showed um, 13 titans from the previous time frame. We've added six to that. Um, I know if, uh, if you went to the economics talk yesterday with uh, Ayo, uh, he showed some brilliant numbers on how many titans are produced. Uh, we're not taking all of them. There'll be some for you to blow up as well, hopefully. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll uh, uh, we take a... Sorry? What happened to the Titan? They're just on, on a Pant account. Okay, yeah, uh, what happened to the Titan was the question. So they're just uh, located on a Pant account, not going anywhere. We might take them for a little joyride in Polaris, yeah, you know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> blow them up for fun, you know, during... Yeah. <laughs> I like that, we'll, live event. We'll, we'll try and fraps it. Uh, if we t take a, a closer look at the binding bot, sorry, uh, is there a question? Yeah, is this how EPP can afford the Joby ship like the players frigate? Is, is this, yeah, is this, <laughs> what, yeah. I think no they comment, take one yeah. tritanium to produce, so. Uh, what was the <laughs> is this how CCP can afford the Polaris frigates? Yeah. They're free. Yeah, we, you know, get them. So this is the mining ships, if we take a closer look at that. Uh, the Venture is a very popular one. You so get this in the tutorial. Um, it's also not the most efficient one, so I quite like that they're having to... Uh, they've been downgraded. Yeah. Now you're in frigates, and uh, also if I have my way, you'll be in a rookie ship soon yeah. enough. Also, it, uh, <laughs> we, we think it shows that we're catching you early, also, before you're advanced into these mining parties and stuff. Uh, then we have some f interesting data. Here's an old favorite. Yep. Bots by Alliance. So that's uh, one alliance with 21% of everything. Yeah, they're that's pretty bad. Yeah, it's pretty bad. It's a good question. Yeah. It's a just, you know, for shock effect, I guess, yeah. you know. But uh, since, um, since we can't name and shame, how about, uh, how about I show you where they live? So, you all, all know this place. We uh, have a lovely Eve map here, filled with all you lovely people, and then we have some not so lovely people. This so. is uh, mining bots by region. Uh, high sack, pretty popular. And, you know, this is by region, so don't read too much into it. Uh, same with the IP, source IP information. It, there's it's no. It's all, a lot of it is in high sec. Uh, a long track in the forge. If we go to the combat bot, which is the mission bots and the rating bots, it lights up a little more uh, around the edges. So uh, we can see uh, up in Jove's space, those guys are pretty well behaved. Um, <laughs> I'm hoping next year we can show you a, a similar thing for the entire map, but uh, probably not. <laughs> Since we have this lovely map, we thought we'd also show you the ISK players. So that's they're pretty well distributed all over the place. Cheetah, of course, is the biggest one. That's where all the bad guys go. Wormholes, we have that also down there. Oh, I just have to take this in for a minute. It's so yeah. pretty. <laughs> 
It's All a right. lovely map. So we get, we don't, we don't just ban people, we also you know, deal with their tickets. And there's uh, all kinds of, all kinds of uh, reasons that we get. So for one, people are suffering from <laughs> insomnia. Or they're framed by a disgruntled spouse. <laughs> then they're... You know, st st <laughs> if you live somewhere cold, you know, maybe you need to warm your bed. I think the Icelanders were really close to buying this yeah. one. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, one of my favorites is the gentleman who was uh, banned for botting and yeah, he left his headset on his keyboard and I'm not sure that's how it works. So it m mined, you know, for 18 hours. It's a good headset though. So. <laughs> Your own math. Yeah. And uh, I want to stress that we're not poking fun at anyone with substance abuse problems or substance preferences. Uh, it, the notion that someone on meth would leave these kinds of log patterns or anomalies is just, it's, that's not how it works. Uh, and then it's the old classic little brother. Yeah. <laughs> So Watch out for little brothers. Th those are the most dangerous people in Eve, clearly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, we have those well, we too. Cat did it, These yeah. Just the ones that are most uh, common. But the cat has definitely done it a few times. <laughs> so that's it for us uh, for now. So we'll just uh, give it back to our... Uh, venerable <laughs> Thank you. colleagues. Thanks a lot, guys. Thanks. <coughs> now all of you can feel a lot safer, and some of you not. Security tips and tricks. It's just a brief wrap up on what you should really take care of. Just that you are not one of these guys showing up on one of the crafts from our dearest colleagues from Team Security. Uh, please be aware of the fact that account sharing is not allowed. Um, it happens, of course, and I guess nearly half of you, based on what we know from our systems, already did it once in a while. Um, at least it looks so for us in our evidence, and that's exactly the problem. So that means if you share your account with somebody else, he logs in from a different computer, from a different region, from a different country, of course from a different IP, um, and he also m might do different things with your account. We monitor, of course, from where accounts log in, and we use all this information to detect botters, cheaters, exploiters, and all these crazy guys. And uh, that means for us, if you share your account, it actually really looks like you are botting, your account has been hacked, or things like that. That means you might end up with a banned account, even though you just wanted to borrow it to your friend. Password security. Um, you might have noticed when you, uh, when you created your account that actually you have to uh, add numbers and such to your password, so there is some minimum requirement for the complexity of your password, and that's not really the issue, actually. So we see, we of course see a lot of people trying to brute force passwords. So that happens like while we stand here and speak on this stage. Um, we block IP addresses if we notice people trying to do that. Sometimes, uh, one second, sometimes we we also go there and just for prevention, ban an account when we see that people try to brute force the password for, for too long or just do it from like 10,000 different source IPs and we just cannot easily ban it. That uh, just cannot easily block the source IP. That's why we then just for prevention, ban the account and try to get in contact with you. Very important aspect on that and I will repeat it like five times during the next five slides. We need valid contact information of you. If we don't have a valid mail address of you or any other means to contact you out of game, how should we get in contact with you when we ban your account and want to inform you why we did it? So please make sure, um, this is the first, first announcement of this measure, that you really make sure that your mail address is validated. You can do that in the, in the account management. We had a question over here. Exactly, that's something we're going to come on the next slides as well. Oh yeah, sorry. 
Um, the question is, why don't we force um, people owning older accounts, which have been generated before we enforced stronger passwords uh, to reset a new password, to set a new password which follows the, the rules for stronger passwords? Um, we are working on that. We really want to do it, and we're going to do that somewhere in the future. I cannot tell you if it happens tomorrow or in two weeks or in two months, but we're working on exactly these kind of things. You know, and you might, you might can imagine that Changes like that we cannot just do because we have to align them with all of the company, with all of the departments that might have a stake in this decision, because we might lock out hundreds or thousands of people if we, for example, um, force to have a valid mail address. And a lot of people just did never provide us with a valid mail address back in the time when you were able to use any kind of mail address which has not been validated, and then we log all of you out of your accounts, and then you will open customer support tickets, and then our customer support colleagues are going to kill us because there are 20,000 tickets in one day. That's exactly what the issue. Uh, another question? In 2011, you said you going to We'll be on the next slide or the slide after the next slide. So the question was, uh, multi-factor authentication. We will answer that in a few seconds. Another quick, brief question. So, yeah. So the question is, why don't we encourage people to to change their password with like providing them with some kind of a of a benefit for doing it, like maybe a day of playtime and stuff like that. That's also something we think about at the moment, and which is actually, it will come, but it's also cannot tell you when exactly because of the reason that we need to align all of, all of the ideas we have at the moment um, with the other apartments, uh, departments. Apartments would also be awesome, but departments is correct in this case. <laughs> There's another question? Yeah. Okay, one more, Thank but you. we really need to head on. So. After this one, questions in the round table, please. Yeah. You said like um, you, you would ban all the source IPs of the hackers, but doesn't every hacker use a proxy these days? Exactly. So the only thing we really achieve by banning the IP is to stop the current ongoing attack. And then, after, because we, what we saw is that we, we start blocking an IP, and before the, the attackers actually notice that they have been blocked, their tools are running and running and running, and when they come back two days later, they notice, oh, what the hell, the last two days it ran for nothing. And then, of course, they started again, and then we blocked them again, and if we see that they aim for a few accounts in, uh, specifically, that's what I said, then we go to, uh, by, for prevention reasons, we're going to, to ban these accounts, reset the passwords, and get in contact with the owners of the accounts. Okay, let's briefly skip on um, IP and region monitoring. I already gave away a lot of this information just right now. We actually really use this information. So we have been asked um, in the comments thread to our dev blog, um, is will there be an option to restrict that only people from a specific IP or specific region will be able to log into my account? I cannot tell you if this option will be there anytime soon. It's, of course, a very good idea. You might, by accident, lock yourself out of your account if you set it to a specific IP or region and then somehow it changes or you move or you try to log in from holiday or something like that and then you locked yourself out of the account. Um, these are all considerations we have to take into account when we're going to introduce something like that. But I can, I can tell you that we already use this information uh, very successfully in, in um, detecting hacked accounts, for example. That's why you saw the statistics of hacked accounts and where we actually are able to detect it even before you open a ticket because um, I guess it's a, at the moment it's a four-hour cycle that we do analysis and generate reports of accounts which log in from different regions within specific time frames and things like that. So we actively monitor these kind of access to accounts. Here it is again, announcement number two. Please validate your email address. Um, in order to do any real security measures, in order to, do, to improve account security, in order to provide you with a, with a valuable channel uh, to communicate with us and us with a, with a trusted and legit channel to communicate with you, we need verified contact information of each and every one of you. Um, the idea that has been, or the question which has been asked, why don't we just provide people with some kind of a benefit if they validate their mail address is a very good one. We think about it, but even though before we enforce you to do it at some point, uh, I want to really ask you, just do it. Um, go to secureifonline.com, enter the mail address, click on the verify button and verify your mail address. Future plans for account security? 
Multi-factor authentication, as already noticed in the audience and asked, is still on the, on the nice to have list. It's on the list for years already. Um, it also has been promised, and we might have been a little bit over motivated promising it already two years ago, because the main reason for that is that, um, first of all, we really need, need to get the prerequisite fixed. Like, what is the benefit from providing you with multi-factor authentication, and then we only have like 20% of all the accounts where we have actual contact details of? So it's pretty hard to, um, to increase account security without even being aware of the fact if we talk to you guys when we want to get to you, when we want to issue you some kind of second factor authentication information, when we want to provide you with additional features. Um, that's why most of the additional features we want to implement for account security really require us to, to have a, a, a real way and a, a sane way to communicate with you, which is, which is also being revalidated on a regular basis. So that's very important for us. So another time, please verify your mail address. Oh, yeah. Exactly. So the question is on how we can actually uh, communicate with you and provide you with, with hints or information um, that somebody is trying to, to, to deal with your account who should not do it um, in a secure way, so without providing you with a false sense of security or without you th making you think that this is a phishing attack or, or something like that. There are ways to do that. Like, for example, we can, we can send you an email. Um, we can, for example, name in the email one of your character names. So that's something, first of, of course, maybe you tell people what the mail address is, you registered your account to, where we, the specific character names are on, but by naming a specific piece of information, um, we can show you that, okay, this might be the real guys, that might be CCP sending me the mail, and then we can add a link, for example, uh, so that the actual real message or info, information you are going to grab from the account management page or from a specific link with an ID, which is hosted on our trusted, secure website so that you can click on the link and then you see this is an original CCP domain, it's a, a valid certificate, and there is the message, and the method states somebody is trying to get into your account, we banned the account for preventive measure, please uh, get in contact with customer support to get it unlocked again. So there are options, and that's well said, we, we think about how we can actually implement it in a way that we're not going to, to kill uh, our player base, or that we're not going to log out all of you. Also, yeah, the question is that if, if we could not somehow implement it into the, 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 the login workflow, for example, for email address validation, that we show up a pop-up in the game client, please do it. Yeah, that's all the kind of possibilities and how much effort it actually is to implement it, what we're talking about at the moment. Let's briefly uh, go over one more example before we end the presentation. Yeah. All right, so would you buy this? I guess not. So this is an example of in-game scamming which is, um, according to our terms of conditions, it's totally legit. You can do this. But the point is that he, this guy wants mon 1 million ISK, and in the formula, he wants 1 billion, which is a difference. And second of all, there is no item that grants you access to Jita when it's full. So in short, this is a scam, but it is OK to do that in EVE Online because it's your game experience which you create. So I guess this is the end of the presentation? No, 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 no. go on, go on. <laughs> ah, no, no, there are two actually bullet points. So um, scamming is not forbidden, as I said. Um, we have a community wiki where our knowledge base is hosted and where you can see what we outline as rules for those activities. Thanks a lot. Uh, just a few more words. Our colleagues already, ma already named it, RMT. Um, the problem with RMT is not only that it's not allowed, but also that it's super dangerous for you. As we, shown, as we have shown on the previous slides, um, about 30% of all hacked accounts had something to do with RMT. They bought ISK, uh, somehow had, of course, to provide the, the RMT guys with, 
with their contact information, with payment information and, and such. And uh, those bad guys reuse this information to then try and hack your account. So they first off transfer you the ISK after you paid for it, and then they, they steal it back from you. So RMT is real money trading. So it's actually uh, some, some fishy guys on the internet trying to sell you ISK for real money or trying to sell you a Tengu or any kind of items for real money. Brief roadmap, where we're going to, for team security, that means that we are actively still and always working on enhancing detection and mitigation capabilities. Um, we already can detect a lot of things, but you might have noticed that sometimes it just takes weeks or months until something happens to your account if you did something bad. Um, that is just because some of the things just are manual processes to actually revert because it's super complicated when people try to hide their tracks and we are working on automating even more of these tasks. Also, of course, because we want to reduce the time which is required from evidence to bans, which is actually the topic of today's presentation, improve interdepartmental processes so that we want to align our processes and communications with all the other departments, like with customer support and with uh, the game designers and exploit testing teams and stuff like that. We want to strengthen the communication um, in order to improve the speed on how fast we can uh, detect and react problems in the game. Um, also, information security. Um, I already named all, uh, most of them. We want to strengthen the overall security of the infrastructure. We already made some, some very big steps in the last few months. Um, and, and I guess you saw that, that when we're going, going to be attacked with denial of service attacks, it's always, of course, very rough and very hard for us to, to manage the load of traffic that's coming in. And then we, we start mitigations. We work together with external partners. And uh, of course, the first wave is nearly always hitting us, but then we manage to mitigate it, the ongoing attack traffic, and we're going we're gonna to try and do our best and do that in the future as well, so that you guys can still play, even if some bad guys try to take us down. Um, exactly, and then, of course, for, for both departments working together as a team effort, account security, I named um, a lot of these things already. And we really aim to offer a lot more features for account security because we see it as a problem. Even though that the numbers you have seen in the slides that it's like 100 or 200 accounts um, per, per, per quarter, uh, per month, per quarter being hacked, um, this is, of course, not very high compared to the overall amount of accounts, but it's too high for us. We don't, we don't want to see these numbers. Um, you can help us by not sharing your accounts because this is one of the one of the really big reasons why accounts are going to be hacked and also some of the excuses I did not do that that was the guy I lent my account to okay sorry for that um, exactly uh, we want to improve also um, as I said the functionality of authentication um, and also of limiting access to your accounts to specific regions and IPs it has been the question um, that we should do that, I promise you we are working on it, but it's not, not a very easy task to accomplish. Yeah, and the last two slides, Krimi. Yeah, uh, we don't really want to go into creating any stereotypes now, but here's one we uh, prepared earlier. Uh, basically, we think, you know, maybe if you're Kaldari and you're flying adventure, and you're mining in Lone Track or the Forge uh, on meth, <laughs> and you have a little brother, <laughs> then you're probably going to look something like this. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll be keeping an eye on you. Oh, I guess we missed a very important last part. We wanted to proofread the EULA with you guys. So actually, let's just extend this by 60 minutes. And then, oh no, OK. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks.